allow yeah. me then to officially uh, welcome all of the panelists uh, to the panel discussion on the challenges of using administrative records and data integration in population and housing censuses. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Sergian Markic. I'm the chief of demographic statistics at the United Nations Statistics Division. And we are co-organizing uh, this panel uh, together with our colleagues uh, from uh, the Federal Competitiveness and Statistics Authority of the United Arab Emirates. I will then invite uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Mohammed Hassan, who is the Executive Director of Data and Statistics Sector at the Federal Competitiveness and Statistics Authority of the United Arab Emirates. His duties include coordination among government institutions in order to achieve national strategy for statistics and supervision of the provision of data and information supporting decision makers. He is currently a member of the United Nations Global Data Working Group for Big Data. Prior to his current position, he worked in the private sector, including at Microsoft Gulf, focusing in business development and digitizing government services. Therefore, um, Mr. Hassan, uh, would you please open this panel discussion, which is part of the World Data Forum, which takes place from 19 to 21 October, virtually, of course, it was supposed to be held in Basel, Switzerland. And this uh, panel will be then uploaded as one of the contributions to uh, the World Data Forum. Uh, Mr. Hassan, please, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to welcome everyone and thank you for your participation. Hopefully, we will have a fruitful this outcome from this uh, discussions. Everyone knows that uh, 2020 uh, World Population and Housing Assisting Program was approved by the uh, Statistical Commission at the 46th sessions. Uh, the program recognized the population and the housing census as one of the primary sources of the data needed for uh, formulating, implementing, and actually monitoring also the policies and program aimed uh, at inclusive uh, uh, development and environmental and sustainabilities uh, in the countries. Uh, further recognize the population and housing census is of course an important source uh, of uh, supplying a disaggregated data needed for the measurement of progress of the 2030 agenda, and uh, uh, especially the context of assessing the current situation of people by income, gender, age, and geographic location and other characteristics. It was recommended to conduct an administrative census uh, in the countries, uh, and especially at this current situation, I think this is where there is a huge emphasis uh, in conducting uh, an administrative census within this current pandemic. This has actually increased the requirement from the statistical office to, to really go into, the, into this path. An increasing number of countries, of course, are adopting the administrative census and many challenges that we would like to discuss today in this session. I would like to emphasize Everyone is, is aware of the standard uh, uh, practice of implementing or, or, or implementing an administrative uh, census, but we would like to really know some of the challenges and how and how the over and how countries actually overcome these problem. Such methods will really help us on on going away from the traditional approach of going to, to the field, and it involves of course indiv identifying individuals in the administrative record first and then assigning to their appropriate location and, and household uh, uh, and, and household places where exactly they live. The, the, trans, uh, the transitioning from the traditional census to uh, relying on administrative record require, of course, uh, a, a place, uh, a systems, a register that is available in the government. What we've noticed is that government actually collect data for a, for a services, but they don't collect it for a statistical purpose. So NSO and, and other agencies are a little bit fi finding some issues sometimes in the administrative records. The quality and the consistency of the data are not there most of the time. Hence, we would like to know more about uh, how can we really recognize these issues, the challenges in your countries or based on your experience, and how can we really overcome these things. Maybe if uh, my final point, if you allow me is, would like to give you a brief point regarding the UAE challenges and administrative census. Uh, we as a country, we are a federal state country. So we have a federal laws and we have a, a local law similar to the United States. And we consist of seven cities that is being governed by different local and federal governments, different budget, different uh, uh, structure, different also laws in each of the cities. 
experiment on administrative senses and dealing with data uh, databases that are scattered uh, uh, for a statistical purpose give us a registry uh, of, of not only 10 years old, but even more. But the problem was is the consistencies. The, the one major issues we face is the transform, the, the, the individual actually, or the household work in one place and actually lives in other place. And the, trans, and the, tra, uh, the transfers between the cities are extremely high in the UAEs. So in order to really solve such problems, we put a standard practice. If that individual, does not, uh, we could not find a register of him in the three government records, we're gonna eliminate him and we put him in the other city. So we would like to hear more of the challenges uh, based on your current experience and how can we really learn from the uh, over, uh, or how can we really overcome these challenges based on the experience that uh, we will hear from you today. Thank you very much, the floor is yours. Sergeant, you are mute. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Hassan, uh, and uh, uh, thank you for setting the stage for this panel. Uh, from uh, the side of the United Nations Statistics Division, uh, allow me just to, uh, um, to, to brief you very briefly uh, on the, the work that has been done uh, now in assessing the impact of COVID-19 on the 2020 World Population Housing Census Program. Uh, and uh, in, our, um, in our documents and uh, what we are documenting now from countries all over the world is the fact that this COVID-19 pandemic is really uh, accelerating significantly uh, the decision of countries to, uh, to shy away from canvassing the country and to use administrative and other registered sources uh, for, uh, conduct, for producing small area census statistics. So this panel comes at a very appropriate time to uh, essentially uh, learn from uh, the countries uh, that have experience in uh, generating uh, census statistics from registers. And obviously, as we are seeing uh, this in 2020 round, the number of countries going that way only increases and it is uh, spread all over the world. So with this, allow me to uh, uh, just introduce the presenters. Uh, we will start with the, uh, the presentation from um, uh, the Kingdom of Bahrain. And we have Ms. Maha Abdullah Sab who is the Acting Director of Population and Demographic Statistics Directorate and Information and E-Government Authority of Bahrain, that she oversees the planning and operation of population censuses and household service. In a prior position, she served as Chief of Environmental and Social Statistics. She is the national focal point for the reporting of SDG indicators to custodian agencies. Additionally, she is Bahrain's representative in the Population and Social Standing Committee, as well as the Development, Progress and Sustainability Indicator Standing Committee at the Statistical Center for Cooperation Council for the Arab Countries of the Gulf. She represents Bahrain in the Population Policy Committee at the Secretariat General of the Cooperation Council for the Arab States of the Gulf. Uh, we are really glad to have you, uh, to, to have you with us, uh, Ms. Sapt. So would you please take the floor and introduce your presentation about the experience of generating census statistics from register in Bahrain. Uh, thank you a lot. Um, I'm really happy to and glad to be here to present the Kingdom of Bahrain experience and conducting census using administrative record. Bahrain has been conducting census 19, since 1941. The 1991 census was a significant shift in the methodology as the central population registry was established and we used the data, the available basic data on individuals. The individual's data was copied and the questionnaires and the missing data was collected from the field. Bahrain conducted 2010 census by using administrative record in addition to a household survey which with a sample of 15,000. Uh, in order to complete the unavailable data and the administrative based census, administrative based records such as number of rooms, number of bedrooms. For 2020 census, Bahrain decided to conduct the census using administrative record without any supplement, supplementation of the sample survey. The reference date was March 17, and the data will be released by end of this year. Why we are conducting, conducting census using administrative record in Bahrain? First, the existence of the population registry, which was established in 1941, in 1984, sorry, based on the 1981 census, 
uh, the role of the, di the, the directory of the role of the CPR is responsible, or, or the role of the CPR is to establish a data bank for population information, the coordination uh, for with the coordination with the government bodies in order to exchange, obtain, and use of information electronically, issuing personal identification card and numbers, the CPR cards, to all Bahrainis and residents, linking all personal details, and the registration of economic and non-profit agents that are not registered in the commercial register, in addition to the registration of, of the vital events. Having the central population registry, with the National Statistical Office and in addition to the birth and death registry under one a governmental body, which helped, which made it, which made it easier in conducting census in terms of capturing data, better understanding of the data and the database and avoiding delays in retrieving data. And as all as as you as you all are aware, the integration of database is important. Therefore, the, the, the government data network GDN was established in 1994 to have a high quality integrated system of processing data on population, housing, building and establishment. The GDN links more than 300 sites and is provided with a sophisticated security system. Ms. Saft, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we are seeing only the first slide. Are you running your presentation with the slides? Yes, um, I am. Uh, we uh, unfortunately we are seeing now we we are starting to see sorry sorry for interrupting but we couldn't follow fully your presentation so please uh, please proceed okay uh, i'm now in the reduction cost or reducing cost uh, are you with me in the slide yes yes we are please go ahead so using administrative records has been very cost effective as you can tell from the graph in 2001, when we used to conduct a traditional census, it cost us about 24.6 US dollar per person. While when we used the combined method in 2010, it cost us only 3.6 US dollar. For 2020, it's expected to be less than one dollar per person. Other reason of conducting census is having the classification unit at IGA, which is responsible of unifying the classification as per the United Classification Standards and to create operational codes for new occupation and to be added to the central population registry. The CPR is used for all services, whether it is financial, health or educational uh, issues with which no service will be provided. Thus, will help the system to, gen to generate various statistics required for the census. Public is constantly requested to update the information, such as occupation, addresses, and education, in order to get services. For example, the unemployment the unemployed person will not get unemployment benefit unless he changes his status in the CPR to unemployed. Uh, I will go through this slide quickly. Uh, uh, the main, the main, the main source of the uh, the main source for conducting census we are using at IGA is the population registry database, as it, which is as, which is have been used as the main source of information, and we are also relies on other databases to retrieve additional data. Challenges. Uh, to be honest, we do have lots of challenges. First, uh, per the first challenge is, which is the data preparation for the census as per the United Nations definition, uh, take a lot of time and effort, especially when the classification used from different source of data is different. And, and thus we need to be convert them. Uh, the problem with the classification also will lead many items to be classified as others, especially in industry classification and employment status. We do have incomplete registers or incomplete coverage in some areas. Uh, regarding different scope of each database, uh, databases normally compile data in, in the service-based manner, not taking into consideration the, the statistical requirement or the usefulness of the quality of the data. And we do have the delays in delivery of the relevant administrative data and metadata to the National Statistical Office. Lastly, the degree to which the administrative based census will meet the demand of the current and the potential requirements. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Misa. Uh, we will uh, certainly have some follow up comments and questions uh, uh, from the panel. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, it would be good to hear all the presentations so that we can um, uh, 
uh, we can uh, target the questions and the comments in a more efficient manner. Uh, let us move now to uh, the, the north. So let us move to, uh, to Norway uh, and the experience in Norway that has uh, been considerable in the past several decades. Uh, so uh, they are using the population register as the base for generating, uh, again, census like small area statistics. And the, the presentation will be, um, uh, will be done by Mr. Helge Brunborg, who is a demographer and a retired researcher from Statistics Norway. He has also worked at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Since uh, his retirement, he has primarily worked on international recommendations on refugee statistics, civil registration vital statistics, measurement of statelessness, the demography of armed conflict, and long demographic time series for Norwegian and international institutions. Helge, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Sir John. Can you hear me, everybody? Yes, we hear you quite well. Okay, okay. now let me try to share. Let me see. Uh, yes. Uh, is it okay? It is, yes. Okay. okay, I'll go ahead. Thank you, Sir John. Um, uh, let me first recapitulate why re register based censuses. I call them register based because they're uh, based on administrative data stored in, in administrative registers. Uh, the first is, of course, to save costs, which was mentioned by the previous speaker. The cost savings are enormous. Uh, and secondly, to use data that have already been collected. So it's a kind of reuse, uh, environmentally friendly. Uh, the third is that it's better to spend the resources on improving existing data than to collect new data. Fourth, that it covers the total population, even population in remote areas and uh, special uh, and minorities. It reduces the response burden on the population, and there is no sampling error, as in sample surveys. Uh, so so th those are the major reasons why we want to do that. <clears throat> uh, now, there are some prerequisites for register-based census. The, the certain conditions have to be met, and I talk now in general, but based on the Nordic experience. The first is that you, you need to have a re reliable population register and a good civil registration system. Uh, this registration system is uh, really the backbone of the population register. Secondly, you also need to register migration if uh, the census statistics is going to be uh, estimated or calculated for small areas also. You need to know where people live unless you're going to do the census just for the whole country and not for regional for small areas. Um, third, uh, you need an identification system for linking registers and, and data, preferably using uh, um, identity identification numbers or national identification numbers. Fourth, uh, there's a need for other relevant and reliable registers, which we have just heard about, say on employment, education, health, income, etc. cetera. Uh, those are the prerequisites. Uh, uh, of course, it takes a long, the, the main challenge I think is that it takes a long time and a lot of work to, do, to do, develop this system. Uh, it's not done if you decide to do it uh, next year because of COVID-19, it's a bit too late to start now. You have to start uh, about 10 or 20 years ago, I think. Uh, finally, there needs to be the statistical office of a country which uh, usually runs the census needs to have access to register for statistical purposes. There needs to be legislation in place that makes that possible, that doesn't violate uh, the laws on privacy, etc. And there needs to be um, practical solutions, uh, that there's a good institutional cooperation, that the uh, uh, computer uh, systems uh, speak to each other and communicate, and the confidentiality of the data are taken care of. Those are the most important uh, conditions for conducting register-based censuses. Now, in Norway, we had uh, uh, the past five censuses have gradually developed from being a, 
or traditional, completely traditional in 1960, to a completely uh, administratively uh, based census in 2011, why using more and more administrative data. Uh, in Norway, the Central Population Register was established in 1964 based on the census 1960. Interesting that in Bahrain, uh, this happened exactly 20 years later, uh, established in 1964. And at the same time, 84, I mean. And at the same time, unique identification numbers were introduced and assigned to all residents of the country, including foreign citizens. They should know that all this is basically a register for of residents, not of not, not of citizens. Citizens can be have a special record in the register, uh, non-citizens, if that's important. Um, uh, and the, the subject matter statistics were then tested and published in uh, in different areas, and the uh, quality gradually improved so that. Uh, the administrative data were introduced in censuses when the uh, quality was sufficiently good. So already in 1970, date of birth and gender was introduced, was collected from the administrative data. But um, say uh, labor force participation was only uh, introduced, I think, in 1990 and uh, or 1980 and uh, households were introduced in 2011 the, as the last one. Um, moreover, the census has now become an integrated part of uh, a register-based statistical system in Norway. So the census is nothing special uh, anymore. Uh, in principle, we can make census statistics every year uh, or several times a year, in fact, but um, uh, and there's no more, uh, no more uh, statistical uh, census publications are not published anymore. But we do conduct, we do make uh, tables for international comparison, uh, sort of census tables. Um, in the 2011 uh, census, which was the the most recent, and the uh, uh, and the first uh, fully uh, preserved census, the following registers were used of population, where uh, place of living and age and etc. Um, migration, families, households were uh, drawn from. There was a cadaster which uh, provided information on housing and geographical characteristics, uh, housing and buildings. Um, the business register, which uh, provided information on employment and place of work and industry. So in fact, if you know where people live and you know where they work, you can uh, estimate uh, commuting as uh, Bahrain had some problems doing. What we cannot do is to know how people commute between uh, uh, their home, where they live and where they work. These three registers are what we call the base registers. But there were also other registers were used, uh, registered on the labor market, providing information on unemployment and employment, occupation and status. Uh, moreover, there's an educational register, which provides information on all uh, educational attainment of the population and the current activity status that for students, if they are currently undertaking any uh, education. There's the national uh, social insurance systems uh, provides provide information on pensions, say on old age and disability and sickness and unemployment, etc. And uh, income from the tax authorities provided information on income and wealth, um, etc. So those are the main registers, but you see already seven large registers uh, were used. Now, uh, the challenges, this is my last slide, um, uh, is that some census data are difficult to obtain from registers. Although we have now using a lot of registers, we have long experience, there are still some problems. The first is uh, recently established registers. It takes time to achieve good data quality 
Uh, and one was the, the, the dwelling numbers, which were into, introduced in 2001, but it, uh, all dwellings didn't have numbers at that time, but in, and even in 2011, there were some that were missing, especially in, in cities and in very rural areas. Um, then there are variables that are of minor importance for administrative purposes, so they are not collected or recorded or the quality is not so good, say, duration of employment. Um, but the employment is there, but for how long a person has been employed in a special uh, business uh, is more difficult. And this is a uh, sort of typical census variable. Another challenge is that events that occurred before the register was established. Um, and one was uh, immigration that occurred before 1964 when the uh, register was established. Um, uh, okay. And another one is events occurring abroad, say foreign education. This is a special problem for immigrants to Norway that many have education abroad, but this is not registered in Norway. There have been a survey to record this information uh, later. And, and some people who went abroad for record, uh, education, uh, including myself, uh, uh, this education has not been recorded in the register. I checked, in fact. Um, and then there are topics that are not feasible to, to, to uh, record in uh, uh, registers or they are not relevant. For example, emotional rel relationships, we would like uh, consensual unions when people live together without being married. It's hard to know if a man and a woman of approximately the same age lived in the same dwelling. Are they really uh, partners in the, in the marital sense or are they just friends or perhaps relatives? Uh, this is check now if there's more than 15 year, di year difference, they are not considered uh, partners in there. Uh, another one is um, the housekeeping definition, which is uh, the standard definition is a uh, uh, housekeeping that most meals are had together or most nights are slept in the house, but uh, the register cannot keep track of uh, how many meals people have in their family or who sleeps where and when. And the uh, last example, I mentioned transportation to work. We can, we can find out where people work and the distance between the uh, home and the place of work. We, we can even calculate or estimate the time it takes to travel by public transportation between these places. But how people go, we, we don't know. Today I went to uh, to work from my home by bicycle, and this is not uh, recorded, uh, of course. So these were the some of the challenges. But as I said at the beginning, the main challenge is really developing a system that uh, stores and um, consistent data and de develop the quality of the data so they can be used um, in the census. Uh, but fortunately, the long term, the goal should not only be the census, it should be uh, the development statistics in general. So the rewards can be, the, the fruits can be reaped quite soon. It, you don't have to wait for 10 or 20 or 40 years before you uh, reap the fruits in form of a census. They can be reaped almost immediately by, by having uh, better uh, um, statistics, say, Population by age and sex from a uh, population register. Thank, thank you. Those were my initial remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helge. Thank you for this overview of how uh, Norway uh, developed the, the system uh, to ensure the production of, uh, of uh, timely and, and reliable statistics. Uh, and then, of course, the efforts uh, and, the, and the challenges and the time it took uh, to get to, to that point. Uh, let us now move uh, to the east, uh, and we will uh, now hear from uh, Ms. Hae Ryun Kim, uh, who is currently a senior statistician and policy analyst at the Center for Wellbeing, Inclusion, Sustainability, and Equal Opportunity in OECD. Uh, prior to joining the OECD, uh, Ms. Kim 
uh, held the position of director of the Big Data and Statistics Division at Statistics Korea, uh, whose acronym COSTAT is quite well known, where her responsibilities included planning big data utilization and products, as well as managing cooperation with big data providers from the private sector and international institutions. At COSTAT, she also served as a deputy director of the Economic Statistics Division and the Research Planning Division. Ms. Kim, please go ahead, the floor is yours. She's on mute. Uh, Ms. Kim, would you unmute yourself, please? We cannot hear you, Ms. Kim. Okay, can you hear me? Now we can, yes, please. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, I repeat again. <laughs> thank you, moderator, and then thank you for organizer UN and UAE to give me an opportunity to present Korea's experience on this very, very sensitive issue. And then I'd like to go on with my presentation. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Move on to next slide. No? Yes, yes, it's moving, it's fine. Great. Okay, in Korea, there's a two approaches for the housing and population census. It's first is based on Easter census. So it could uh, cover whole population in Korea and only 16 variables is available to using Easter based census and it conducted every year. But second approach is that every five years we conduct a sample survey as well. So 20% whole population is surveyed. And then in this case, we have large variables could be available. And these two approaches is conducted in Korea. So this year, 2020, so we will conduct both as well. And the history is a little bit longer. We started to this register-based census. We first started 2007, and then first we have to this introductory period we prepared all legal basis and um, established some strategy and plan. And finally, we approved from National Status Council to conduct this list of basic census. And second step is, of course, we need a research, a deep down research on how to, how to conduct this methodology. And then use collect the address data, which address data is available. First, we have to check and review, and then collect and then construct a database. And of course, in addition to research, a deep down research is also conducted and pilot tests we done. And finally, the first hour register based census conducted in 2015. So it is keep going on. So up until last year, it was conducted. The production process is much the same as first we have the data collection and then from the 14 agency and then 25 data sets registration data sets, which is include resident registration register and foreign register and entry and departure registers, etc. And the first, it is very, very important to standardize because the different concept in different definition and coverage. So standardize and coding of this data. And finally, we link all those different register data sets using linkage key. And then finally, compare statistics. Of course, there's a lot of opportunity to use register-based census. We might know there's reduced survey cost as well. In, in case of Korea, is a 50%, almost over the 50% reduction of budget. And also response burden, only 20% sample was surveyed actually in the field. So 80% reduction of the response burden for the people. And also we think is data quality. That means as 
previous speaker said, non-sampling error and survey error, and try to, there's no fully omission of the record. And then also, of course, encouraging the timeliness of the result. And there's a lot of opportunity to, especially to provide new statistics. If you establish hopefully complete registers, we could make a new statistic using this record. However, we face, of course, we have, have faced many challenges and still some are solved, some are still we are facing now. So first, in Korea, might the other countries, same situation, we have a very, very strong data protection law. So that means that personal information law, so we cannot use easily to personal information. So under the, this law, there's a need, each individual, we have to get the approval from the using the personal information. However, we may change the, our statistics law to could use personal information and the, under the statistic purpose, that means statistics law. So, and also another uh, option, another um, option item is in the our personal personal information protection law is uh, the uh, for the purpose of statistical purpose. Then means it is only exempt this law. So we could use those legal basis, but however, it is totally depending on data providers. That means. Only for this is reluctant data provider provide, they could decide it, which item to be provide and how long time series data could be provided, such kind of things. And also this is only for official statistics. To implement list based census, we have to pilot study, a lot of research needed. In that case, we have to try to collect other different data sources. Not only, yes, other data and also other sources. For example, we, we could use a mobile phone data such as using, for using big data project. But uh, it, this law we cannot use. We cannot collect the private sector data and those kind of other different types of data sources. So if this legal basis does not provide a strong power for NSO, so there is still room for. So that's why I put the, this second item as a, as a challenge is lack of cooperation from the data provider. So they, in, in this law also it is need a consultation with the data provider for each items that we collect. So depending how data provider are cooperated. And, and third challenge is a lack of data quality control. As we know, it is not produced by this assumed data is not produced for the status purpose. There's a lot of different in the methodology and different, there's low consistency and missing items, records. So it just takes a long time to data cleansing and cleaning and the methodology issue, for example, if missing record, we have to use the imputation methodology. And also it is very difficult to standardizing and linkage. So different differences I told you and those kind of classification of house and address, it takes a long time. So for example, the difference coverage in, the, in Korea, we use residential register. Actually, this register is excluded, actually, actually leave foreign abroad, foreign countries, that means like for study and work, it is not increased. For example, for me, I still keep the address in the registration, resident registration system, but I live in Paris, but still keep my record there. So they have to separate it with this one. So we use an extra additional population for this is missing, for example, uh, immigration record as well. So that means we need a more advanced data to complete or so to accurate to population counting. So less challenge we face is, uh, I think it is also some Norwegian case, Norwegian case is you could use uh, income level and education level but in Korea, we cannot use it because we cannot get access to text data. So, and also we cannot get access to personal education history data. So those kind of demographic variables is very, very important. So we need to those items of data, but up until now, it is very difficult. So totally depending on the cooperative, you know, constructive cooperation between the NSO and then data providers. So in my opinion, there's a key factor is also related uh, challenges. So need to enhance statistical law for collection of data as well as other data sources. 
And second one is a strong cooperation between data providers. So just to try to make some consulting committee or advisory committee to meet so often to data provider and explain that why do we need and that also it is also related because data providers are kind of worrying about their secure of data. So that means there's they are worrying about the personal information that could be leaked if you provide it. So we have to sure about the, ensure the data protection. How NSO is very strong, um, strongly protect our personal information. So we have to do it, and also IT system because when we come collect the data from data provider cannot carry just a USB. So we have to systematically construct the data collection system, also linkage system and data cleansing editing system. Could be IT infrastructure is very, very important key factor. And lastly is the capacity building. So not only just the NSO step also to be the data providers steps, that means they have to notice why data is important. Thank you. That's the end of my slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, a comprehensive presentation on how COSTAT is actually uh, facing a number of, uh, uh, of challenges in order to ensure the full uh, use of the registers for, uh, for producing small area census statistics. Um, and then we will again uh, get back to you later on with uh, some follow-up comments and, and, and questions. Uh, let us uh, uh, go back to uh, to Europe uh, and uh, let's hear from uh, uh, Mr. Eric Schulte uh, Nordholt uh, from the Netherlands, who is a senior researcher and project leader at Statistics Netherlands, uh, where he's responsible for the Dutch virtual census where all tables are estimated based on already existing data sources, registers, and surveys. He is Statistics Netherlands advisor on the statistical disclosure control uh, and social data. He acted as an observer in the censuses of, of 2011 in Kosovo and 2013 in Bosnia and Herzegovina on behalf of the Council of Europe. Since 2018, he's the international coordinator of social statistics at Statistics Netherlands. And since 2020, he is chair of the steering committee of the UN ECE expert group on population and housing censuses. Uh, we did have that meeting uh, ending up yesterday, Eric, right? And it was really a very successful one, uh, by all means. So this is another example of the country that combines uh, uh, registers and surveys in order to produce uh, reliable census, uh, uh, small area statistics. Eric, please go ahead, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the introduction. Thank you also for the invitation to speak here on the challenges of using administrative records and data integration in population and housing censuses. We had um, this week for the first time a virtual uh, bilingual meeting uh, in the UNECE. Normally we meet in Geneva, but this time everything was virtual. That was quite a challenge. And uh, well, I'm glad that so many people could still um, present their papers and so much information could be shared. Um, well, I think I don't need to introduce myself because Tridon has already done that. So that's uh, a point that I will skip. I decided not to um, show any slides because we have only a few minutes. So I thought it's better to give a speech and um, tell a bit more about the situation in my country, the Netherlands. We have been moving from a traditional to a register-based census, um, but this, this was a gradual process. Um, in the Netherlands, we have conducted 14 traditional censuses in the last two centuries. And the last traditional census that we conducted was in 1971. And actually the census was a success from the user's point of view. It was very happily used, so many people we're willing to analyze the data and to use the data. But there are also concerns about the privacy of the individuals. And there were also some worries about the ever growing costs of population and housing censuses. So the government decided that a change was necessary. So we had as a statistical office to, uh, to look for another methodology. And that is what we now call the register-based census. It was a gradual process, and there are some similarities with the process that was described 
by my Norwegian colleague, there are also some minor differences. I also think that the UN recommendations, both the UNSD recommendations, but also the different regional UN recommendations reflect the move from traditional censuses towards step-by-step -step, a fully register-based census. You have also asked me to say a few words about um, capacity. Um, when you want to change your census methodology, you need to test thoroughly if the change is feasible, if it works. Um, I don't believe in, in Big Bang theories. I think that um, every time you have the opportunity to improve and to be more cost effective in your censuses, you should do so. And every time you want to test it very thoroughly so that you know that this move is correct and is um, leading to a result that is um, appreciated and approved. So that requires capacity every time. But in my opinion, these investments have been very fruitful because now we have a much cheaper census than ever before. You also have to look at the legal framework because as a statistical office, you have to stay within your legal framework. Um, for the censuses, we used to have a census act, a separate act, but that act was rescinded in 1991 because it was no longer considered necessary. And since then, all the official statistics, including the population and housing census, um, uh, is under the Statistics Act. As we had some issues regarding the privacy of the individuals participating in our census in 1971, um, later on, a Privacy Act was introduced and this problem was actually tackled that way. And being a European Union country since 2018, we have the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, an act for all European Union countries to protect the privacy of the individuals. So that's also important to guarantee that the information that people give will not be published at the individual level, only at the aggregated level. Then we have to think about the quality of the data. Are the quality of the administrative data that we use good enough to use in our census? We have gradually developed a whole system of different what we call base registers. These registers are heavily used by different organizations. But for us, it's special that we use all these registers and we are allowed to combine the data at the individual level. So we use the microdata of these registers in our office and we combine that. These registers are improving over time. The quality has improved. We have also developed a quality framework to check thoroughly if a certain register is fit for purpose, if it's already good enough to be used. And this was also of help, for example, when we thought we have an education register, it's not yet complete, can it already be used? Well, the answer after a thorough study for the 2011 census was no, it's not yet good enough. Now, preparing the 2021 census, we say yes, it's good enough, it's better than any other source that we have. These are important moves and important judgments that you want to motivate by some research done in the census teams. It's also important to update the registers that we use. We are now heavily dependent on the um, data owners, the register owners. We don't have the illusion that we can tell them what to do for us because they have their own tasks that we share data, and this is also a government principle, that the government should ask people things only once, and that the different authorities should share the data. That saves a lot of time and money. It saves also response burden on the country. This updating is important, um, and we have lots of discussions, there are lots of management teams, but in the end, we take the data as they provide them to us, uh, for granted. And we check the completeness um, and say, well, now it's fit for purpose and now we will use it. Of course, there are risks that you miss some people when you have a register-based census. Um, a missed population 
sometimes also called illegal people, people who are actually in the country, but not in the register, are by default illegal people. And we try to make estimates of those numbers. Those numbers are relatively small um, in the Netherlands. And that's because everybody wants to be registered. If you are not registered, you will have a difficult life. For example, if you are looking for a job, you need to be registered. You need to have the unique number. Otherwise, if an employer employs you and it's, it's found that he's employing you illegally, you will get a high fine. So employers want to hire people legally. They don't want to pay high fines. If you have children, your children go to school, you need to be registered. If there is a, is, a, is a terrible accident, you will be helped in the hospital. But for the regular health care, you need to be registered. If you lose your job, you are unemployed, you can get the benefits, but you need to be registered. If you open a bank account, you need to be registered. So everybody wants to be registered. It's a hard life if you are not registered. We do make estimates of the number of illegal people, but we provide those figures separate from the census. The census in register-based census countries is based on the legal population, the registered population. There are also maybe variables that are not complete. For us, there's only one such variable left. So gradually the number of variables that is not in registers has decreased over time. Now we have only one census variable that we don't have in registers. And for us, that's the variable occupation. We don't have an occupation register. We would like to have that, but we don't have it. So what do we do for tables, uh, including the occupation variable, we reuse microdata from our labor force survey, where we ask many people about their occupation, and then we weight those tables to the population totals. So those tables are estimated tables. But in earlier censuses, we had many more variables that were estimated. So we have, after the 1971 census, always had a mix of register and survey variables. But the number of register variables gradually went up and the number of survey variables gradually went down. But we have never had census questionnaires again after the 1971 census. I could talk on for many hours, but we have only a few minutes. So I give the floor back to our chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Eric, uh, and thank you uh, uh, for uh, really uh, providing a comprehensive overview of the development of uh, the uh, uh, production of census-like small area statistics from a combination of uh, registers and surveys, and the way that these dynamics between these these, these two changed over 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 time. And this is really uh, another, I would say, quite important note to, to, uh, to take into consideration. Uh, we would like now uh, to um, open just a, a small discussion uh, by addressing several questions to each of the panelists. Uh, and then uh, we uh, did consider to uh, have uh, two types of questions. Uh, the first one, which would be uh, really uh, general questions. Uh, to be answered by all the panelists and then uh, for each of the panelists we would like to have a very specific uh, question so for the general questions uh, for all the panelists uh, quite uh, all of you actually mentioned the importance of the uh, legislative background uh, for and framework for uh, the exploitation of the register for statistical purposes and uh, uh, this is indeed one of the issues that are uh, uh, dominant in the, the debate uh, regarding confidentiality and the privacy of data, as we have heard as well. So the question is, how long did it take to come up with the legislation and how complex and how, how complex and complicated that effort was in terms of convincing uh, the legislative bodies of uh, uh, this uh, need and necessity of using registers in more than just one uh, uh, way and just one purpose. Uh, was it really extremely cumbersome or, uh, or was there a kind of understanding from the legislative uh, bodies, uh, primarily the parliament, uh, in order to enable the exploitation of these data? This is really very important uh, in terms of providing a kind of advice to countries on how to proceed uh, in order to ensure that all that is done in uh, this respect is based on a very firm ground. Uh, the second general question we would like uh, to uh, 
uh, to entertain uh, to entertain with is the question of staff training. As we are moving from uh, from the traditional statistical exercises such as the census and the surveys, where we did have a very specific profile of the statistician skills that were needed in order to uh, perform those uh, exercises in terms of uh, uh, of uh, sample specialist, in terms of the methodology specialist, and now we are. Uh, really in uh, the phase where we need more of data miners, we need more of the administrative knowledge in order to uh, to uh, use the, the administrative data for statistical purposes. How considerable efforts uh, were uh, put into uh, changing the profile of the statistical office in terms of ensuring that the staff is up to the challenge of uh, really switching from the, say, uh, traditional uh, role of a statistician to something which is in between the statistician and data uh, data engineer. So uh, this is also, I believe, uh, important to understand uh, that uh, these kind of changes uh, have a kind of a cumulative effect, not only on uh, the the the, uh, the the profile of the agency, but also on the profile of the staff of the agency in terms of skills that are necessary for it. As for all, uh, for the particular questions uh, for. Um, uh, for uh, the, uh, the the question for Bahrain uh, in in slide in slide seven, Ms. Uh, there is a diagram showing the filtering, validation, and quality assurance process that is undertaken during the production of the census register and census outputs. The question would be very specific. Uh, you also mentioned that there, some of the registers are not complete, and that you have the issues uh, with the quality of these registers. Uh, once you go through all the process of filtering these data and validating these data, is there any feedback loop that you go back to the uh, to the, uh, the the authorities that are in charge of these registers and pointing to the deficiencies that you have identified uh, in the process of validating the data? Uh, the question is whether there is this kind of uh, cooperation in terms for, of uh, checking the data uh, from uh, the uh, uh, the point of view of uh, 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 of ensuring that the changes that you are making and uh, errors that you are finding are reflected in the registers back there. For um, uh, Norway, uh, for Helge, so the two questions uh, definitely are, are uh, the, the channel for saints. But if you could provide uh, being uh, in uh, the in, in in this process for such a long time, over fifty years now, the three major the three major lessons or points that you would uh, like to convey to all the countries that are considering switching and producing a system that is not perhaps identical with the one that Norway has put together, but that is put uh, under the same premises. So what would be the three major points that you would like to emphasize out of the experience that you got uh, 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 along in, the, in uh, Norway? Uh, for Kostat, Ms. Kim, uh, the, uh, the 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 question, the 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 question that you mentioned is uh, again the, the 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 quality of the registers and the the fact that there are a lot of uh, difficulties in making sure uh, that the, uh, the 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 data that are coming from the registers are really suitable for the purposes of uh, of uh, uh, producing statistical outputs. Uh, so the question is pretty similar to uh, to the one for Bahrain. Do you have a feedback? Do you go back to the registers, and uh, do you have a kind of a partnership with them that will ensure that they are aware of the process that the statistics COSAT is undertaking in terms of the uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, cleaning this data and validating them for statistical purposes? Uh, and then for uh, and then for Eric. The, the, the question is, the spe very specific question is about the costs. Uh, we are quite, uh, quite uh, say, um, quick uh, to point out that if you have this kind of system like the Netherlands, then the costs of producing census statistics is minimal or non-existent. However, there is a, 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 a huge cost in terms of running all these registers and a huge cost in, in cleaning all, all of this data. How do you actually present these costs in terms of uh, the functioning of the the national statistical system of uh, of the Netherlands and uh, are those costs reflected and are clear to everyone or uh, are they uh, uh, assumed to be really uh, negligible and therefore not necessary to point out 
as a kind of uh, the budget item in the overall uh, functioning of the of the national statistical system. So uh, with this, uh, perhaps we can reverse the order of uh, of uh, of uh, our panelists, and uh, we'll start with Eric, uh, and then we will move our way uh, the other way. Eric, please go ahead. Thank you uh, for the questions. Um, I will first uh, answer the general questions and then the specific question for the Netherlands. There was a general question about legislation. Um, in my country, the Netherlands, um, we have used administrative sources for quite a number of years now, but in the first years, it was voluntary cooperation. We were discussing with register owners, would you like to work together with us? We would like to see how your data would fit in our official statistics and how they compare to the surveys we currently conduct. And for them, they could also get some um, quality controls on the processes. Um, we could also help them with some IT issues. Um, so that was kind of a, a deal that we made with a few register owners. And when these projects became successful, we thought, well, it's nice to replace survey questions by data from administrative sources. But then we need to be sure that we will have these administrative sources every year, for example, so that we have yearly statistics based on administrative sources. And that's why we told also the government, we can work cheaper, we can have better quality, but then we need to be sure that we get access to these administrative sources. And in our Statistics Act, that was taken into account. So we said we can work with a smaller budget, which is always attractive for the government, of course, but we need to have this access. So since 2004, this is in our Statistics Act. The other government authorities in my country have to share their microdata with us if we need them for producing official statistics, including the census. The second general question was about staff training. Um, that's really important. The world is changing. The way we produce statistics is changing. So you need to educate your staff. It also implied that in the old days, we had a lot of people doing relatively um, simple manual editing activities. Those activities were less and less necessary. So those people who retired were not replaced by similar people, but by smaller numbers of people who were higher qualified. So over the last decades, we have mainly hired highly qualified young potentials, young academics who were willing to work with us. And you see that the number of people in our office has gradually decreased a bit over time, but the education level has increased. That's really um, quite a, different, a, a difference. For further training, we have the Central Bureau of Statistics Academy. So we have lots of courses, for the, especially for the new people, to learn more about the processes, the way we work, and uh, get better qualified for the practical work we do in the office, in addition to what they already know from their education. And finally, of course, there's also a lot of training on the job. If you hire good people, you educate them, but in the end, you need to tell them and, and, and work together and, and learn them the skills they will need for their daily work. Then you had a specific question about the cost of our census. Well, the cost of the upcoming 2021 census is relatively small because we have all those data already uh, in our office. So the costs are estimated to be around two and a half million US dollars. That is a very low amount compared to census costs in other countries. These costs are mainly labor costs. So the people working on the census, checking the data, producing the tables, writing the press releases, this whole process um, over a couple of years, that is the cost estimated. If we would have conducted a traditional census, it would have cost a few hundred million US dollars. That's clear. But that is comparable to the cost we had in 1971, the last traditional census we had in our country. 
the comparison of this cost estimate is not quite fair because we have a register-based system in the country where so many organizations profit from. Um, it's difficult to say how much that would cost, but um, we, we have been trying to make estimates uh, last year of those costs. Um, setting up such a system would be approximately the cost of one population in the housing census. But all the people work with us to update their information in the population register. So once you have set up all these registers and the people give information to update it, well, then you are there. So it's, it's a one-time investment to set up the system, and then it's a matter of maintenance. And I think that is important to keep the data up to date, because if you don't keep the data up to date, in a few years, they are useless. And I think that's, uh, that would be very sad. Those were my answers. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, Ms. Kim, please. So now you can hear me, right? Okay, yes. we'll go to with the general questions. First, uh, the restoration basis, legal basis. It, yes, it takes a long time to put this law to cost that use the recent data. Instead, this law, it takes a long time. So it is not easy, just a one-time kick. The may, uh, law is changed. So we before that, we have to consult so many agency. We have to meet them. And also we parliamentary people to why do we need to have, we have to change this kind of law. So a lot of efforts have we done cause that. So finally we have done in 2007. So we could start to collect all this data. So that means uh, cause that need keep continue communicate with stakeholders to change statistical law. So it's not easy process, but we have to do it without legal basis is cannot we cannot collect this data. And second question for the, the training or capacity building for step. So in Korea, first we got our sources on the methodology, how to link it, how to collect data or what kind of audience data exists. So we cross collaborated with the academia. So first we outsource this kind of research, how to conduct that's the basic census. So we research the other countries' case and then try to apply to our Korean case. Then second, those we have our own research center. So in terms of methodology and invitation on sort of complicated one, we conduct research. We ask them research on this subject. And so we got a feedback from the, we have a strong cooperation with the headquarters and the, restoration uh, division, this uh, division and also research center. And third factor, we also have a training center on set. So we trained our staffs to how to data link is, how to make a program and the, those kind of things regularly done. And also internally in this division in charge or research teams, we conduct still, we keep going on on the research. So previous experience, we have to develop this part. We have got a strong research on that. So research and then also training people is key factor as I told to my presentation. So we have to use those various uh, way to training ourselves as well as sometimes we need our sources to research how to do it. And for the specification, yes, we, in my presentation, I mentioned as we established an advisory board with a data provider. So we often communicate with data provider. And then if we have some raise and some quality issues, we could consult with them. And then they could reply and they could give some feedback of that. Not advisory board as well as individual basis. Then means staff have a question. We know the someone who in charge in data provider. So we try to contact them and ask them what is this data and try to ask them explaining. So those kind of cooperation is still existing. So first, of course, from the beginning, it's very, very difficult to get a cooperative support from the data provider. But as time goes by, we can trust each other and then we could build a strong cooperation ship. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Helge. Uh, please be mindful of the time. We do have uh, another six minutes left, so please take this into consideration. Yeah, thank you, Sir John. Um, three major points of the development, uh, about development in Norway. One, uh, first, skills of the people, uh, the staff. I think there's been a gradual development to people knowing more about the subject matter and that people make their the statisticians, they, they make their own tables. They do the merging of data from different registers themselves. Uh, previously, this was done by computer people who made all the uh, tables. Uh, secondly, I think an important aspect of the development in Norway is that there is very close cooperation with different register owners. And there, this is trust between the uh, register owners. It's not that uh, we don't want to share the data with you because we don't trust you, or we, uh, as in some developing countries, data is power, and we don't want to share our power. Uh, uh, there's nothing of that. It's very close cooperation. Um, uh, the use of mathematics. Uh, mathematical statisticians has been limited. Uh, there was one in 19, 1990 when there was an attempt to uh, uh, combine panel um, sample data with, uh, for a sample with a full uh, administrative data set, but that was not so successful. Um, I think that dwelling numbers should have been introduced earlier to be able to make household statistics, but um, the dwelling numbers were really introduced for administrative purposes and not the statistical. So it, would, it was the tax authorities and other um, authorities that really uh, wanted or needed the dwelling numbers, uh, but uh, perhaps statistics Norway could have been uh, pushing this. So that's why it took almost 50 years in Norway to have a fully uh, administrative census, whereas in Denmark it was uh, much shorter, between 10 and 20 years, I th think. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, one last point is that there's a lot of trust. Uh, the population has a lot of trust in the government, and that helps. The, that helps a lot also in the development of this. And last point, Norway is a relatively small country, and it's easier to do this in small countries than in big countries. Korea is a big country. I don't know if you have more problems than that. Uh, Netherlands is a small country geographically, but we have a large, fairly large population. So uh, it's uh, it's easier in small countries than big. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helge. Uh, Ms. Abt, please. Yes, uh, regarding the legislation, yeah, it is, we do have the Act number 19, 1977, which uh, stated that all ministries have to be uh, co cooperate with the, the IG, the National Statistical Office, in terms of conducting census. And now we are uh, updating our statistical law as well. Uh, in terms of the training and building capacity, since 2015, we established the Census Task Force, which is consists of statisticians and IT person. The rule was used to uh, identify and update the census basket items and identify the data, the data sources, as we ha do have a lot of databases right now. We do have a, a productive uh, database for productive families, for healing uh, persons or healers as well. Uh, and uh, uh, regarding the data, the data producer, I believe that we have another question for uh, for Bahraini. Yeah, uh, regarding the validation and processing, going back to the data producer, we do have uh, an, a national uh, census task force as well, consists of all data producer representative, and we are uh, uh, communicating with them on, 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 on a daily basis regarding uh, do, uh, the validation and everything. We start doing a pilot test since the third quarter of 2019 to test the data and going back to the data producer. In terms of we have, in, in case we have some issues or problem with the data, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Abs. Thank you, all the panelists. This was really, indeed, a, a, a very comprehensive overview of how you are developing uh, the use of uh, registers for the purposes of generating uh, small area census statistics. And I believe uh, this, uh, uh, your experiences and what you heard uh, today, is uh, going to be extremely useful in terms of. Uh, foreseeing the next round of population housing census is based on uh, the experiences of in this round. Uh, I would just like uh, again to thank you profusely to all of you for your time and uh, for participating at this panel. 
uh, the, the, the challenges of using administrative records and data integration in population housing censuses, which is part of the World Data Forum, one of the biggest, I would say, gatherings uh, of uh, data specialists uh, uh, in the world. And this is going to contribute to the overall program of uh, uh, the World Data Forum. It will be posted, uh, the, the World Data Forum uh, uh, goes from 19 to 21 October. Uh, this um, uh, panel uh, will be posted as a recording on the 12th of October uh, on the site of the World Data Forum. And from there on, we can expect to have uh, follow-up comments uh, or questions to the panelists uh, that we will monitor. And of course, we'll, uh, we'll uh, throw them your way for uh, further comments and suggestions. I'm mentioning this simply for you to be uh, aware that this is not the end of the panel, that there will be certainly uh, questions from uh, people uh, listening to this recording and then wanting to uh, hear more about certain aspects. And uh, uh, finally, before uh, we run out of time, uh, which is in actually 30 seconds or pretty, pretty on time here, I would like to express a, a specific uh, appreciation uh, for Ms. Uh, uh, Razan Ismail uh, from uh, uh, the uh, from the, um, the, the, the Federal Competitiveness and Statistics Authority of the United Arab Emirates and uh, to Mr. Uh, Saif Etadesse of UNSD for organizing uh, and uh, all the logistics and making sure that this is really a very successful event. Again, until uh, we hear uh, later on uh, this month, thank you all. And we unfortunately do not have the opportunity of being physically present, but then congratulations and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for participating. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone. Oh.